Hello and welcome to Growth Coaching International's Coaching and Education Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Reid, and today I'm delighted to bring you the latest in our stories from the Coaches series. Over the last six months, I have had the privilege of chatting with a number of the GCI team with a view to gaining their insights and thoughts on developing coaching in our schools. In this particular episode, I'm excited to be joined by Lucy Carroll. Lucy joined Growth Coaching International in 2019 and brings with her over 30 years of experience in education in diverse settings across Australia and internationally. Most recently, Lucy has worked at the Institute of Positive Education at Geelong Grammar School, promoting student, staff and family well-being through innovative education programmes in the field of positive psychology. This role has taken Lucy into schools across all sectors in Australia and has stretched as far afield as Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai and Germany. Prior to that, Lucy led a multidisciplinary team at Catholic Education Melbourne in the development and facilitation of quality professional learning for teachers and school leaders. Lucy is an accredited coach with GCI, holds a Master of Education from the University of Melbourne and is also a Governor of Iona College in Geelong. Lucy, it's lovely to have you join me on the podcast today. Oh, good morning. Thank you so much, Richard. It's lovely to be here. You're very welcome. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Lucy, to kick things off, I suppose, give people a bit of context. Can you maybe share with us your journey in education so far prior to joining the team at GCI? I was just listening to your introduction there and I was beginning to feel a bit tired, (laughs) Richard. (laughs) Um, I have had a really varied career in education. Um, I've done some very different things, and yet I think I've always considered myself very much the educator, no matter what I'm doing. I was originally a primary school teacher and loved loved that work, and then I had the great opportunity to move from working in primary schools to working with Museum Victoria, which is a wonderful institution here in Australia. Um, it has a science museum, it has a beautiful social and natural history museum, and also we had... I was there for the opening of the Immigration Museum, which, of course, is really significant when we're telling Australia's colonial and settlement yeah. history. Um, and I think, think in thinking about my work, that's where the big thread of being really deeply interested in people and story really started to come through. Um, I've written, published um, student books around... Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, a lovely, beautiful project of interviewing young people, kids, about their immigration experience and then writing their story to be published. Um, that was published mm. by Macmillan Publishers here in Australia. It was called We Came to Australia and was exploring all of the different themes that they had. So that was, I think, when looking back, um, some of that work, particularly as a museum educator, was very, very rich and got me thinking outside the box of schools in mm. some ways. Um I've also had the great privilege of working on some very big community projects. So I've actually spent as much time in my career working with adults as I have with students. Okay. Um, And then I worked in at a system level and our big focus was school improvement. I pretty quickly learned that that can be very dry (laughs) (laughs) and, um, and quite tedious. And often you're trying to drag people to come with you on the journey. And yet um, that's when I came across GCI. I had the opportunity as an educator to, who was meant to be leading system change to undertake some um, coach accreditation um, training myself. I undertook the coach accreditation program and then continued it and extended it and then wanted to learn more. And then I did solutions focus masterclass. I ate it up because I really understood that um, – you know, leadership, the tone at the top is so important and you, nothing will happen unless there is really committed leadership. And I saw coaching as one of the most effective, both opportunities and, and interventions in some ways to be able to really help move people's thinking and shift them towards what's wanted rather than this awful problematic focus all the time. Um yeah, so, and then as you mentioned in the introduction, I had the enormous privilege of working at Geelong Grammar School, which was the school that um, had hosted Martin Seligman way back. Uh, Martin Seligman, when he was the head of Psychology Association mm-hmm. of the United States, and really it was in his thinking around what if we were to take the traditional tenets of psychology and flip it and think about, well, what works? Why don't we do that more with the broader population? And Positive yeah. psychology was kind of born. 
Mm-hmm. John Grammar School was the school with which he worked over many years as an ongoing relationship, and that's where positive education was really initiated. So I came in after that had been happening, but it was an enormous privilege to work there, and they really were committed to taking the idea of Martin Seligman's PERMA model, which is the positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishment, and really seeing what does that look like when we're talking about education practice in schools. So that opened my eyes again. So, And after that, I've come to working as a consultant with GCI, and I'm so excited because so many of these things, it's a bit of a weird path. It's been a serendipitous career, actually. <laughs> but um, I think the thing that I was reflecting on in preparing for today is I have always said yes to the weird opportunities that came my way. So I guess I have approached things with openness. And again, that's another attribute I think I, well, I hope I bring into my coaching. Yeah. But I'm sure that attitude of saying yes to those interesting opportunities, other people are the better for it because, you've, yeah. you, you know, you, you've brought that attitude to it, which, which is terrific. And listening through there, Lucy, the one thing that really struck me was your comment, I'm deeply interested in people and their stories. Yeah. And when, when, you, when you look at quite a wide variety, as you say, of, of experiences in your career, which I think is terrific, um, you know, you know we, we are as people, you know, we develop constantly every year and, and the more varied the, the, the activities that we're involved in, particularly within education, you know, the better the educator we come. Because you, you did say, you know, bottom line, when you peel all the layers off, I'm still an educator. You know, and an educator is, 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 is terrific, a terrific term. And, and that idea of being deeply interested in people obviously ties in with where you are now with, with, with the coaching the coaching work that you do. And I suppose, and follow up to that question, you know, looking back over that time, would you say there were specific skills or insights from your background, from your, your very background in education that you feel, you know what, those are really, really valuable in my current role now? Yes, Richard, thank you for picking up on that. The, the, the idea of people and story is really central, I think. And I guess the attributes and skills are really having that, that the notion of being really open and curious, which are some of the, you know, our, what we encourage in a coach stance. So they're definitely things I think that my career has primed me for to be able to do this work. I also love learning. I love learning new things. And I love walking alongside people who are as excited as me and kind of nerdy about it, <laughs> like, you know, to get really into it. Um, I find that really energizing. So I think, um, yeah, and maybe it's all of us have the capacity to coach really well when we bring our best selves. You know, if we bring our if we bring our own strengths and just lean into those. Um, but I definitely think the dispositions of being open and curious and s- seeking growth in both myself, but also in that being my hope for others. Um, yeah. And they really definitely align with coaching and a solutions focused approach. I love that idea of, I mean, just boiling it down to, I love learning. I mean, as educators, that should be at the very core, I suppose, of, of who we are, and particularly as coaches. And it, it's encouraging to me, and it'll be encouraging to our listeners as well. Lucy, you know, when we hear, you know, one of GCI's coaches talking about seeking growth, yes, in other people, but also growth in yourself as a coach. I think sometimes, I know for me as a coach, quite often think, you know, I didn't get that bit right, or I still need to improve on that. And you know what? That's okay, because we're constantly growing as coaches. And I think that's, what we need to be sharing with other people out there who are trying to develop a coaching culture in their school and they think, well, I haven't got there yet and I don't actually think you ever do. (laughs) Um, I think the attitude is, as you say, you know, we love learning, we love growing as coaches and I think if you can maintain that, I suppose, in your in your in your approach to coaching within whatever institution you're involved in, um, that's got to be a a positive way um, of, of approaching it. As, as part of the, the, the coach training team, um, obviously, that you're, you're working with now within GCI, you obviously work with educators who are new to coaching. Maybe some folks are arriving in and they simply are at square one, mm-hmm. uh, which is an exciting time for people. Is, is there one key coaching skill at that stage that you would say, listen, I really would emphasize this at the start during the early stages of, of training? Richard? It's listening. <laughs> listening. <laughs> it's as simple and as hard as that. Yeah. As simple and as hard as that. There is a real discipline in actively listening and everything around our way we live our lives gets in the way 
of that. So Mm. it might seem obvious and yet it takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of self-awareness to notice how you're showing up. Um, I equate listening well with the work of John Gottman and that idea of when someone approaches us, they are making a bid for our attention and we have a choice point there to be how do we respond to that bid. If we can just listen, even if it's for the moment to say, that sounds really important, I'd love to talk about it more. I haven't quite got the time right now. We've still turned towards that person. So we can build relationship through listening. We build understanding. And I think we build humility too because it's actually an exercise in us putting ourselves aside for a little while. Um, It's totally worth the effort listening. It fixes. It heals. It grows people. um, It makes space for other people. So I really think listening is the foundational skill upon which all of the other coaching skills and framework actually rest. Without the yeah. listening, I don't think it's possible to coach well at all. I think you're right, Lucy. And then, I mean, personally, I would be right with you on that on that choice of skills that listening is central to what we do as, as, as coaches. And if you think of it, of it, about all the other skills, they're extremely important, but they will fall flat if listening's not there. You know, so so I'm 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 right with you on that one, and I know that, you know, there's a, <laughs> it sounds like it's, it's such a simple thing listening, and we all think we're actually fairly good at it, <laughs> but once we get into the coach training, as you know, mm. you're smiling at the moment, especially those you know educators who are coming in for the first time. I did this myself on my very first coach training back in 2008. I thought oh, I'm I'm actually a fairly good listener. Yes, I reckon <laughs> I would put myself up reasonably high there until I get into what deep listening actually meant. And then I realized, goodness, I have a long, long way to go. Yeah. Um, but but I, I, again, I think that's that's encouraging for folks to hear, you know, that, you know, what seems like a simple skill, you know, is just so central to, to, to everything that we do, but it is a skill that we can learn, a skill that we can develop. But wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. That's where the hope lies. <laughs> and that's where the growth lies, that we can always pay attention and, um, Yeah, that's what I think is so heartening about a learning the skill of coaching because it is a skill set that you can develop over time. And then the other discipline, I guess, or disposition is that you're really tuned into self and um, Mm. have that focus to be present to others. Could could you share maybe, you know, thinking back over over the last, well, the last few years, you know, is there a success story where an educator's coaching journey has had a significant impact, Not, not just on their own role? but also the learning experience of their students. I have a really recent uh, story to share. Okay. Um, I have been facilitating a one of the GCI um, Introduction to Leadership Coaching courses in a school. Um, I love doing both those courses where we do them open for the public as well yes. as where we do them in-house on site in the school. And this school had opted to have two, the two days of the course spread out over a week, which was terrific because people had time for the ideas to percolate. And also mm. my I had challenged them <laughs> as they were <laughs> leaving day one to say, I want you to look for the coachable moments. Go see, find them, see if you can notice them. Um, Yes. So I, this one particular teacher had really taken that on board and she was looking for coachable moments everywhere. And she then shared a scenario with us when we regathered on day two. Her role is to, she's in a secondary school and her role is to manage the student leadership programs where they do sort of um, community-based work. So she had been out visiting a primary school with her senior secondary students and they're they had an activity that the senior students were leading with the younger kids and a couple of the younger kids were going pretty off track. (laughs) The senior (laughs) kids were getting a bit frustrated and thinking, I've never asked to be here anyway, this sort of thing. Um, And there was one kid being quite dysregulated. So and it was impacting how everyone was experiencing what was meant to be a lovely program. So she said, okay, this is all not going well. And she thought, well, perhaps it's a coachable moment. And she gave us the example that she paused in listening to the senior secondary kids saying, this is not working, I don't want to be here. And paused, listened, paid attention and listened, and then started asking positive reframing questions like, well, if this was going as well as you hoped it would today, what would be looking like? So she really Mm. tried to really hope, turn that person's eyes to what could 
be possible and what was wanted, what might be some things then you could try towards that. Yeah. Let's see and come back and I'm here and I'm supporting you towards that. So it was fantastic because in some ways it was like a coach coaching someone else and who then needed to go and coach somebody else. Yes. <laughs> um, so it was a lovely sort of domino effect of her pause point helped the senior secondary kid feel engaged in the exercise that they were doing. Mm. Plus, it meant that the primary kids were having a lovely time with their big brother, big sister model, you know, that they've got yep. going there. So the teacher was so pleased with the outcome and it was a real – we got a sense in the group of her sharing that story that was their real clear growing awareness of her impact. But lovely for you to be able to get that feedback, you know, Absolutely. particularly so recently – you know, on the back of some training that, that you're involved in and then, you know, a, a, a teacher like that being able to give a, a lovely example of, and I love your your your, your, your phrase, the pause point, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I suppose that brings in the whole sense of self-awareness, you know, this idea of, you know, I'm going to pause here, I'm going to think through what I'm going to do first, I'm going to listen, first of all, and then I'm going to ask a question that's going to help move this forward for the other person. Um, and that's difficult to do in, in a you know, in a scenario when you're a teacher and things aren't going particularly well, because quite often we just <laughs> want to fix it quickly. You know, we want to, you know, not that we want a quiet life, but we want to try and improve things quickly when you've got a lot of children around, you want to try and make the most of the project. So being able to, I suppose, discipline yourself to pause, mm -hmm. and it's not pausing for a long time, it's, it's pausing for a very short period of time, yeah. but it's still, as you say, a pause point, which, which is that's, so that's a, lovely, a lovely example, Lucy. The field of education, as you know, is is constantly evolving uh, and never seems to stop. How does your work with GCI adapt to stay relevant uh, and address maybe the, the changing needs and challenges of educators in today's world? Mm. I think it's really important that GCI, our coaching courses, our group um, our group opportunities where we might be working directly with schools and all of our individual one-on-one -on -one coaching, I think it's terrifically important that we recognise the changing landscape for teachers. Mm. Um, in Australia, perhaps I'm not sure what it's like for our other listeners around the world where they are, but in Australia we're facing a massive teacher shortage. Um, it's generational. It's come after the baby boomers who are now retiring um, which creates a lot of, I don't know, there's a lot of knowledge shift and loss mm. potentially in that, but there's also a huge opportunity. Um, yeah. So what I'm finding is that there's a lot of people who are thrust into leadership perhaps sooner than they might have expected. Um, yeah. And it's also ve it's very stretched. It's not – a lot of these leaders are having to still – maintain a lot of their face-to-face -face classroom and teaching mm. loads and juggling lots of different responsibilities. So yeah. I've walked into some meetings recently, meeting a new leadership team, and their collective age was sort of 26. And I thought, wow, there's, there's a lot of learning and a lot of also massive opportunity and enthusiasm. I think we need to stay cognizant of what's happening on the ground for people. And that's when we do show up and we listen and we're curious about others. And yet, I think coaching, I'd like to describe it as like coaching can be like a still point in a turning world, I think. Um, I think that no matter what's going on around us in our busy, crazy environments, there's actually always a need for thoughtful, professional conversations. And in that respect, Richard, coaching's never going to go out of fashion. Like it's always what's needed. It's, I actually really believe that the more formally people can be trained so that they can then be flexible and agile in the moment in their, these professional conversations, the more we can be paying attention to what's actually happening for people. So in many respects, I don't see coaching as changing. I see it as deepening and expanding mm -hmm. to really help address pe what people are experiencing. I, lo I love that idea that coaching – is not changing. It's, I suppose, the world is changing. Education, as we've said, is constantly changing. But coaching maybe needs to be there as the constant. And I, I love that phrase, that it's a still point <laughs> in a turning world. That's fantastic. You know, I don't that, know that, where that, I've got that from. It sounds very <laughs> 70s to me, but I just, <laughs> it's part, I actually was thinking going, 
No, it, the coaching needs to be yes the constant. And I, I do believe that I know some of the leaders who are flourishing are people for whom they are regularly having coaching, leadership coaching as part of their own personal practice and professional yeah. practice. Yeah, yeah. Because because the role, I mean, speaking from experience, the role of headship, it doesn't allow for for still points. It just doesn't really no. lend itself to that, uh, unfortunately. And that's where if there is coaching available for a head, a principal, then that's invaluable. You need to grasp that with, with both hands. Um, I had the privilege a number of years ago coaching a principal of a very, very large primary school over here. And she chose to have the coaching conversations in her office, which is right in the very center of the building. So for her, it was a moment, like you say, it was a still point. That mm. R was a still point. And she loved the fact that she could have a coaching conversation, that confidential conversation in, in, in that sort of setting. And she could still hear the noise and busyness of the school outside the office. But it was such a contrast with how she felt in the coaching conversation. It just struck me when you said that yeah. still point in a turning world. So I just pictured that room, her office yes. was a still yes. point and the school was was a turning world outside. But yeah. it fits in so well when you say that coaching needs to be the constant, you know, and, and, and I think that's, if, if, if I'm getting that right with, from what you've said. Yes. And I think that I love the idea of the, it's both the physical space that can be the still point and it's also the almost psychological space, I guess. We're talking about we're creating a moment, a little bubble of psychological safety around ourselves with the coachee and also, or being coached ourselves. It's really important as coaches. For me, one of my most powerful still points is when I have my monthly ongoing coaching with a trusted colleague who has been a mentor and yet as a mentor, stays firmly in the facilitative coaching mode. It's been very, very powerful to maintain that. I seek and yearn that, yearn for that little moment in my busy world too. So um, I think we're giving each other a gift when we can stop and create that space with others. Absolutely. I love that phrase, you know, that no better gift that you can give another person is time for them to think. You know, Absolutely. and help them do their best thing, and that's where the that's where the still point comes. We can't think, you know, we're not doing our best thinking unless it's a, unless it's a still point. So, as coaches, we're facilitating a still point, generating a still point, which is we, we could be writing a paper by the end of this podcast, <laughs> Lucy, on a, on a whole on a whole new, oh, a whole new thing, which <laughs> is terrific. It's terrific, <laughs> Lucy. There, there are. I'm sure in your work you come across, you know, common obstacles mm. um, and sometimes misconceptions that educators encounter. So they're, they're moving into this idea of coaching that, you know, they've seen coaching that they think that this looks quite appealing. I'm going to maybe get a bit of training, but there are common obstacles and, and misconceptions. You know, can you give us any hints and tips? You know, how do you assist them in overcoming these, these challenges? Yes. Well, I think the main obstacle people experience is time and that's got to do with how they imagine coaching needs to be many believe many leaders believe that they actually don't have consistent time for that either one-on-one -on -one coaching for themselves or for the capacity to coach other members of their teams because many people mm. come into our training seeking to be a better leader and helping mm -hmm. to grow their own practice and build capacity and efficacy with the people around them and I think a lot of people then give up on the idea, oh, I can't, don't have an hour, I can't run through that whole framework, I can't do it. Um, so that's why I think that's really important that in our GCI coaches and in all of our interaction, so our, sorry, our coaching courses and in all our interactions that we help leaders understand the difference and nuance between formal one-on-one -on -one coaching and mm -hmm. the idea of taking a coaching approach to leadership. Yeah. Yeah. So if we think about a coaching approach, leaders can actually apply themselves to learn that skill set and then then they will be able to notice and and actually take action on the coachable moments which arrive on a moment by moment basis in a school or in any other educational setting. So most interactions in those places like when you think about it are brief, are pressure prompted, are in the moment, they're on the fly. So I think that we more often need to use a coaching approach rather than we would ever get 
to sit down and have one on one time with people in a yeah. really, yeah, you know, consistent way. And I think once that's understood, once it's understood that you can be doing this in every moment as a leader, it's a choice, then the time becomes a less of an obstacle. So how do I overcome time as an obstacle? You by making coaching the work rather than additional to your work. And I can see exactly when when, when you're explaining, you I mean you started straight away with the, with the word time. And yes, you have busy people arriving in to receive some training and coaching and their heads full of stuff um, and, and time is is what they're extremely short of. So to add in something additional, immediately you're going to get that response or that reaction. <laughs> How do I add in more things? I think you're right, Lucy, you know, if, if at, at an early stage in the training, you know, we're getting across, yes, there are formal coaching moments, yes, that you can timetable, they're invaluable and they're a luxury in many schools Mm -hmm. uh, and many schools don't actually get to that point but if you can organize it terrific but there are and i've written it down here as you say lucy coachable moments all day every day so from the minute you get out of your car walk across the car park or whether you get trained to work walk to work whatever it might be from the first person that you meet until the last person that you say cheerio to in that school and that school day that busy day there will be coachable moments present themselves yeah. Um, and I suppose part of the training then is to be able to discern discern what those coachable moments are, to be able Absolutely. to notice them. Yeah. And then once it's you the notice noticing. them, yeah. yeah, you know, respond to them. If, yeah. that, if, if that's them picking you up right. Yeah, noticing the moment in the, and then having your pause point <laughs> and mm-hmm. then making a choice, yeah. giving yourself a little bit of time. Another really big misconception that we need to spend time addressing as part of our coaching is that as particularly for people who are new into their leadership roles and who are taking this on because they're really earnest in wanting to be better, is that they think the coach needs to have all the answers. <laughs> and um, this is, of course, a pathway to <laughs> instant burnout as a school leader. <laughs> yes. Um, and so we work in our courses really hard to dispel that misconception. Uh, we want to focus on the idea of a conversational continuum and that professional conversations fall along this continuum from the more directive end to the less mm-hmm. directive end. And we sometimes characterise the more directive as mentoring, the less directive as coaching. However, there's different – we move up and down that continuum all mm-hmm. the time. And I think it's a really big relief when people first realise that it's not on you to know and it's not on you yeah. to fix everything. I often introduce myself, Richard, as a recovering fixer, (laughs) and that's why I came to coaching myself in my own leadership career. I realised I'm managing a huge team. I think I have to do it all. I can't. I can't. And, um, yeah, coaching was a fantastic way to address that misconception. And um, we often then – the flip side of that, though, of this, is that it's the challenge – to practice and maintain that facilitative stance because as educators, I think a lot of us jump to, well, we're kind Mm -hmm. of trained to um, have the answer. So it's hard for us to then, there's, you know, get the idea of that there's less of us in this conversation and Mm -hmm. um, less of our ideas and our expertise. And that's a bit tricky. So we love to explore Michael Bungay-Stania's idea of the advice trap. Yes. (laughs) Nasty little advice monster that's crawling up your shoulder. So, um, yeah, so the way we overcome the misconception of the role of coach is by really, really bringing an awareness to people's stance. Mm -hmm. Where are Mm -hmm. you standing along this conversational continuum right now? And you have a choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's no, that's that's super helpful. And thinking back to my own scenario, my, my first headship. I mean, I was, I suppose, reasonably young at thirty three. Um, uh, my first principal role, and I had had the privilege of having my first coach training the year before that, which was just invaluable. Because I have to say, going into that first headship role, I thought, you know what. I don't know all the answers. I know, in fact, I know very, very few of them. <laughs> so adopting a coaching approach to my leadership was invaluable, mm-hmm. you know, asking more questions um, to everybody around me, which which I felt really, really helpful. And, and, and I do, you know, attribute that to, to the coach training the year before. I just came back into my head, you know, I need, I need to ask more questions. You know, yeah. Pause, take a bit of time um, because, I, you know, 
I don't need to know the answers. Um, I knew inside I didn't know the answers. That wasn't a problem. But I suppose to have a little bit of confidence in knowing that you don't actually need to know them. And here's a way to work that is to, to, is to ask more questions. So yeah. it was invaluable. So as you say, a lot of our leaders are maybe moving into leadership at quite a young age. Um, and whilst that does bring a lot of enthusiasm and, 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 and great ideas and creativity, um, it's, it's nice to be able to say you don't need to have all the answers. Yeah. And a coaching approach to leadership is a great way of, of helping you to, to do that. As, as someone, Lucy, who obviously has coached educators through various stages of their careers, we're talking about you know folks coming in at the start, some maybe who've been in, their, in, in the job a long time. Mm-hmm. Can you share some insights into the personal growth that educators can expect from embracing coaching as a part of their skill set. Yeah, I have the most enormous privilege of walking with people across all stages of their careers. And I I guess I could think about this as being a few different, I've got a few little ideas of a few different stories I could think I could mm. share. Story one, let's think about story one. I think one of the things that people can expect from coaching is advancement. So, for example, I have walked with a number of leaders who are seeking career advancement. Mm -hmm. Um, Through coaching, we've addressed their aspirations and also what their stumbling blocks are. They might that and they that become they're also way more aware of their stumbling blocks than <laughs> than they are of what their strengths might be. So that is yes. important for me and my work with them is to amplify their strengths. Um, and I have been witness to people and their deliberate leadership actions leading them to successfully gaining appointments that they're seeking. So either a new role or mm-hmm. for many people it's sort of advancement in their career. And I'm particularly excited, Richard, as a woman in the mature end of my career, I'm very happy uh, and um, yeah, really quite determined to make sure I amplify women's pathways in their profession. So I really love seeing women flourish and step forward in that way. So People can expect advancement if that's what they're seeking and they're really deliberate around their work. Another story of people, what people can expect from coaching, I think I've labelled this deficit, but this is one of those situations where sometimes the people I have worked with, and I'm not sure about in your practice, but they've been made to come to coaching. They've been Mm. identified as someone who's problematic on staff and they've been made to come. And... um, it's a performance issue that, quite frankly, is probably not being well handled at the school and it's not fair, really. So I always have a bit of an affinity for these people. They're being forced into that situation. Um, so, you know, naturally they're quite resistant <laughs> to yes. being in this relationship, <laughs> quite defensive. And what, I've, what I've, I've experienced and I've enjoyed witnessing is where people, in spite of that, people have been able to – be present enough to slowly chip away and be able to, I have helped with that person shift some of their own experiences um, of that place and that they have then been able to improve their workplace relationships or their workplace performance. So I think perhaps we won't call it deficit. We'll call that story improvement. So we can expect some advancement. We can expect improvement. And um, I think there is a bit of a shadow side there, though, that I think it's really important that schools make sure that coaching's not seen as a something that's done to somebody. It really needs to be, you know, choice and agency. And story three is one I'm thinking particularly of somebody that I've been working with over time who's a terrific gentleman, really thoughtful educator. And um, so this story is about self-awareness. So I think one of the things people can expect from coaching is a growth in Um, Mm self-awareness. And this leader has suddenly faced a change in his circumstances in the workplace and has increased his coaching sessions for a period of time, not for long, but he really wanted a sounding board. So he didn't necessarily need all the answers. He knows that they're possibly within him. He's just a bit sort of confused. So he sought coaching out as a trusted sounding board just to Mm. have a place that's not work colleagues, a bit of a safer place to just test out some ideas. So I think story three is all about uh, people can expect a a safe place, a place for themselves to grow and and really move forward. So I guess the result of coaching for people is increased self-awareness and that personal responsibility that does leave, I see often to a sense of accomplishment. And that might be big things or it might be just the little things that people are really noticing that growth in themselves. 
those are those are super helpful. Those stories, particularly because we've got a variety of them, which which is which is great, Lucy. You know, you've thought through that very carefully, and it, it's it's encouraging for people who are listening because there'll be people in in each of those different scenarios can say, oh, that's me. That, that the coaching could actually help me, or a principal or a senior leader who does coaching in his or her school could say. I know some of our staff who would really benefit from some coaching because you know there, there's there's wonderful examples. And you're right, you know, coaching isn't something we do to people. You know, they need to come voluntarily to to, to the coaching table. Um, otherwise, you're just going to get resistance, and and you won't get advancement. You won't get growth. Um, and I, I think that's clear. So it's it's good to clarify that for for people, particularly those who are listening in. Just as as a final question, Lucy, and and I love this question. What do you think <laughs> might be, and you know, underline the word "might be," the next big <laughs> thing in coaching and education? Ah, uh, um, well, as a sort of a, it's a, this is a bit counter to the idea of coaching being the still point in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> I think the next big thing is coaching, coaching, and more of it. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm actually quite particularly interested coming out of my work with the Institute of Positive Education is that idea of um, coaching, supporting people in their well-being. Yeah. So I had the um, I had the great privilege of working with our colleague, Claudia Oad, who um, mm-hmm. is one of the directors at Growth Coaching International. And she and I collaborated for one of our conferences a little while back around um, the connecting coaching and positive psychology through the PERMA framework. Mm. So that Martin Seligman's PERMA framework, and we did PERMA plus H, which is the health bit on the end. Um, so we took that model and then thought about what does, yes, that's it from a positive psychology point of view. Here's some of the key, um, you know, theories or focus areas underneath those various elements. Well, what does that mean for coaching? So we've often talked about, wouldn't it be good if we could take that further, that idea? But I do really believe that exploring coaching as a well-being enhancer is something that is ahead and or already happening and yeah. um and ahead because i think that hopefully in time we'll have more data that shows that yes when people are being deliberate in their reflection and creating this safe space for themselves to do their thinking and learning and growing that it does enhance their well-being yeah so we, yeah, I, I, that was a really powerful project so for that's something that I'm very interested in there um, and the other part is I did mention John Gottman before and that idea of our bids and mm-hmm. it's building trust in the micro moments I also really interested in the work of Professor Jane Dutton and high quality connections in the workplace and mm-hmm. she has these four pathways for building connection and the reason she's done this work is her research over the years, she's an organisational psychologist and she's um, Professor Emerita, actually, from uh, from University of Michigan, uh, the mm-hmm. Ross School of Business. So very heavily involved in sort of what makes up cultures in, in organisations. And I think that this is really important for leaders who are trying to establish both coaching cultures but also just healthy cultures in their workplaces. Yeah. But she talks about... Um, Increasing incivility in the world right now. There's increasing mm. incivility, um, angst, lack of paying attention to each other. And she talks about the high quality connections to heal that uh, respectful engagement, task enabling when you're a leader helping others, trusting, and that's trusting in others to be able to, I trust you to be able to do this and to learn and grow, and I'm giving you space to do that. And then the fourth way was playing I love that it's the lightness it's the laughter it's never punching down it's never making fun of but it's having a sense of connectedness and fun so um yeah that's something I'd really I think is relevant for us in our coach training too around how we help build trust and connection with others we can do coaching can go a long way to help build relationship which is core to the PERMA framework but also to help bring about healing and growth for individuals and communities yeah that's what i'm curious about exciting times are ahead lucy absolutely <laughs> I think that's that, 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 that's been lovely i love that link with, with with the perma work um but also that when when you use that phrase high quality connection i just immediately think about you know a coach and a coachee you know, or, or two thinking partners and that's when it's working at its best. Don't don't you feel that connection when you are in those moments? I think coaching is a is a process that really fosters 
us building that connection really powerfully with others. And yeah, it's it's a privilege and also a discipline and really great work to be involved in. But it's interesting coming back full circle almost to, to the earlier part of our conversation. If we're to achieve high quality connection with another, so a thinking partner as as coaches, you need that still point. It's not it's not interesting, you know, because there's a there's a really good connection between. So, in order to create high quality connections, we need to create as as a coach, we need to create that still point to be able to achieve that. That's that's what I'm saying in in, in my own head. Um, and and you're right, it's a privilege when that actually happens when you're having a conversation with another human being, and you've managed to create that still point. Then you will have high quality connection with that person, and that's where the growth comes from, which you've mentioned numerous times um, in, in in this conversation already, Lucy. This has been a lovely conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving up your time uh, to join me on the podcast. Oh, Richard, it's been a pleasure. It's been just lovely. Genuinely mean that. The diversity and richness of your education journey, as you explained at the start, has been a fascinating story to listen to. You talk about stories. I love listening to stories as well. You have certainly got me thinking about the connection between positive psychology and coaching, which has been very, very helpful. And I'm quite sure that you've stirred up a lot of interest in our listeners. And on that note, if you have been listening in and you'd like to find out some more information about the work of the GCI team, please do check out our website, where there is free access to a significant number of articles, as well as further podcast episodes. And if you'd like to subscribe to our popular e-publications, Coach Ed Update and Insights, you can do so from the homepage of the website. For now, I've been your host, Richard Reid, and I look forward to joining you on the next episode of Coaching and Education, where theory and good intentions meet reality.